Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous supporters of our uh, support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum Series, lead sponsors Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore this key topic in American politics with our distinguished guests this evening. I am now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Barbara Carvello is the director of the Marist Poll. She oversees the design, analysis, and communications of Marist Poll research projects and results. She is a trustee of the National Council of Public Polls. She has developed and directed studies at the national, state, and community levels for government, private, and nonprofit organizations. Henry Fernandez, co-founder of the African American Research Collaborative, is also CEO of Fernandez Advertiser, Advisors and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, focusing on state and municipal policy. He served in the Obama-Biden transition team at the Department of Housing and Urban Development and has worked in local government and in, legislati and, and in legislative and electoral campaigns. Jill Lepore is the David Woods Kemper 41 Professor of American History and Affiliate Professor of Law at Harvard University. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker and host of the podcast, The Last Archive. The most recent of her many books is If Then, How the Simulmatics <laughs> Corporation Invented the Future. Anthony Salvanto is CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys. He conducts all national and state polling, heads the, de the decision desk that projects outcomes on election nights, and appears across all CBS News broadcasts and platforms. He is the author of Where Did You Get This Number? A Pollster's Guide to Making Sense of the World. I'm also so pleased to welcome Charles Gibson, our moderator for this evening's discussion back to the library virtually this time. During a distinguished career spanning more than four decades, he reported from across the country and around the world, interviewing numerous world leaders and presidents while covering key issues of the day. He anchored ABC World News from 2006 to 2009 and was co-host of Good Morning America for 19 years. Please, wel please join me in welcoming our special guest this evening. Over to you, Charlie. All right, thank you, Rachel. I, uh, I, I liked all the introductions of everybody else. Uh, mine just made me feel old, but that's okay, uh, because I am, uh, so it's, a, it's not unexpected. Uh, but we are gonna talk about polling. I, I think this is a fascinating uh, subject, and it is certainly timely, uh, given where we are right now with so much angst among so many people about what's gonna happen uh, in just less than two weeks. I think it's incontrovertible uh, that polling and public surveys can be valuable. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics depends on them. We've learned a lot about coronavirus through this kind of thing. Uh, in politics, for sure, it's important in terms of finding out what's on voters' minds and what issues they want the candidates to speak about when the candidates are willing to speak about them. But, uh, but I wanna talk about horse race polling. Does the who are you gonna vote for polling uh, provide a social good or is it some way detrimental? And I know, Jill, you have some qualms about that. Um, why? Um, well, first, let me just say it's a treat to be on the panel with all of you and to have a chance to be in conversation with you as well, Charlie. I'm also always an honor to be part of something involving the Kennedy Library and Foundation. It's just such a special place. Um, I will say I've learned so much from the archives at the Kennedy Library about the history of polling and would be really keen to talk about that as well. I do think that um, it is, I entirely agree, it's indisputable that uh, public opinion survey work is 
really important in so many ways. It's an important field of academic scholarship. It's important for all kinds of policy decision making. I think much of the concern that people who are concerned about polling have had historically has been about horse race polling. And there, you know, there's there are good polling agencies, and then there are some less reputable pollsters, right? So, um, I think it's 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 important maybe to distinguish. Uh, it's a very big industry. It's a little bit of an out of control industry, and um, so there, I might make some remarks about things, and I wouldn't want them to be taken um, askance as if I'm make, overly generalizing about the industry. But some of the things that um, we do know about the history of polling is uh, there are real questions about the accuracy of of horse race polling, especially very, very far in advance of an election. Other countries have rules around that, how soon before an election you can do that kind of polling. There have been ethical questions raised in the past about media organizations doing their own polling. That didn't happen until 1975 when the New York Times uh, it was first involved in, in uh, pre-election polling. And at the time, people said it was completely unethical. A news organization does not make news, reports the news. I think that ethical question really is still with us um, in terms of the uncontrollability and the kind of in, uh, uh, wildness, I think, of, of polling because it, it's driving ratings. Um, it, there's not uh, the same set of objectives that we might have in, in conducting conducting that as a matter of, as a public service. So, so, Jill, um, so Jill, if, you, if yeah. you were queen of the world, would you eliminate uh, uh, horse race polling? Or um, uh, what would you do? I I I don't want to be queen of the world. I do think that there have been many efforts to regulate polling over the years. Um, you know, truth and polling acts. There have been efforts to uh, require polling to stop a certain number of days before an election and not to begin uh, until a certain point before an election. I think it's a conversation worth having. I think there's some really good government issues involved there. Um, the research on how whether horse race polling affects or does not affect the outcome is, is I think, somewhat equivocal. And I suspect others on the panel um, can report more fully on, on whether the argument that doing that horse race polling has an adverse, you know, actually influences the outcome is, is a real issue. So let me let me take that to Anthony. Does it? Do you think it encourages voting, or do you think it may perhaps discourage voting? Well, uh, first of all, thank you all. Let me echo some of those comments. It's an honor to be on a panel with all of you. Thank you to everyone at the library, uh, Liz, Rachel, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you to everybody in the audience for joining tonight. Um, I, I've said before, the, um, the, the word polling or pollster derives from an old English word that means head count. But if you talk to a lot of us in the industry, we prefer to be called survey researchers. Now that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but the point is that we try to survey people so that we can understand what they are thinking and why they are thinking it. And back to your question there, Charlie, about horse race polling, it is obviously something I do a great deal of, but I hardly consider it the most important thing that we do. I often say you should, everyone should, judge me and are my fellow pollsters in the industry to judge me by whether or not I explain what the American public is doing, not whether or not I can merely predict it. And I use that word purposely, merely predict it, because predicting things is not the same as understanding. And to the extent that we have horse race polling, where I do think it is important to know which campaigns are finding residents with their messages or which are not, and people who follow politics want to understand that. I really urge everybody to please go a step beyond the horse race. Read the polls, read the questions that we've all tried to come up with and ask. Listen to the voices in the American public. We are in a moment right now where, you know, to say we're divided or to say we're polarized has become obviously a bit of a cliche, but it, it is true. And the American public doesn't even disagree on how to solve problems. In many respects, it disagrees on what the problems even are or the extent of them. The coronavirus outbreak. But Anthony, let, let, me, let me come to that. Let me yeah. come to that point. Let me come to that point. As a former creature of the media, people would always complain to me, well, you're just focused too much on the horse race. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet invariably, Barbara, when you talk to people, 
they will say, well, so-and-so is up 6% in the polls. Um, and, and, and they don't usually, and they, and they usually can, can cite a specific percentage, but you don't hear them say, well, 42% of us care about healthcare, 10% of us care about foreign policy, uh, 10, 15% care about education. I, I, I'm all for what Anthony says. And indeed, as somebody who sat in the anchor chair for years at ABC, uh, I was always for that. But that's not what, as Anthony points out, draws the audience. Uh, it is not why people may watch Nora O'Donnell at night on his uh, on his network. They want to know the horse race results. So, so you're kind of tied to a uh, to a business model there that that uh, you you may not like particularly, but it, that's what it is. Well, actually, I think I have a little bit different take on this. And uh, thank you again. I'd like to echo uh, everyone else's thoughts. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for having me. And uh, Charlie, I've always been a big fan. Um, but I think I have a little bit different take on this. Um, just oh, you to were be, the viewer. We never knew clear. who was watching us. <laughs> just to be clear, um, I am a, am I, I'm a science advocate, and I'm a public polling advocate. Uh, we do our public polls, uh, state the state polls that we do with NBC News, uh, so we're connected to the media. We think of ourselves kind of as polling journalists, just I'm sure as Anthony does as well. Um, we do our national polls with NPR and the PBS NewsHour, and I think it's a really great relationship that we have between uh, academic research and uh, these different media organizations. Um, that said, uh, two things. One, I think that public polling actually lets people in on the secret. Mm. The campaigns are going to be doing the polling. There's lots of things that are going on as to at strategy that is going on as to why candidates are going to different states, uh, why they're looking to uh, garner support from different constituencies, why they're shaping their messages in certain ways. And I think it takes kind of the the, um, the the veil off of all of that strategy to allow public polls to fill the public in on the secret as to as to why the candidates are doing the things they're doing, why they're saying the things they're saying, um, and the places that they're going. So that that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I think this sense of the toss ups and the and the horse race polls um, isn't just the polls. Something that's really changed over the last decade is we now not, don't only have public polls, but we also have uh, forecasters who are telling us, you know, what's the probability and likelihood that a candidate is going to win? Um, what is the likelihood that the Democrats or Republicans uh, are going to um, maintain the majority um, in the Senate? So we have all of these other voices. We also have aggregators. Um, like the um, real clear politics. So these have become all part of our discussion. So it's not just about the matchup and the toss up, but it's also about trying to parse out who's ahead and who's behind. And polling has actually taken a back seat to this. This was particularly true in 2016 when people were so surprised that Trump won the election. Well, I suspect. Anthony, as well as I, wasn't as surprised as we watched Clinton's lead continue to decline in our national polls and her to have difficulty um, in the Midwest, particularly when we also knew the information that the, the candidate was not visiting those uh, mm -hmm. states and the, and the campaign yeah. was no longer polling there. So um, I think there's a lot of- I will, get, I will get to- Barbara, I'll get to 2016 in a minute because I think that's very much implanted in, in the public head. But Henry, let me turn to you. Uh, I, in reading Jill's articles in The New Yorker, uh, I was very struck that one of her statements was a majority of Americans don't believe polls. I, I, I would suspect you found that out by polling, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, do, you think, do you think people have faith in them? We're actually in a so like everybody else. Thank thank you for 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 having uh, having me here. Um, uh, we're in a slightly or, or significantly different business than the other folks uh, here. And so, um, I, you know, do people have faith? I I mean, I think uh, uh, the the truth is that people respond. Uh, campaigns respond to them. Um, 
there's uh, quite a bit of uh, work that's done, you know, media response to them, the public response to them. So uh, people will often say, well, I don't believe them or, or I don't believe this, I don't believe that. But as I said, we're in a different business, which is that um, we actually got into the work uh, at uh, AARC, into the work of polling because frankly, uh, pollsters historically have not polled people of color and particularly African-Americans uh, very well, very small samples of uh, uh, African Americans in most polls, um, and uh, really kind of a sense that African Americans are only, uh, you know, supporting one uh, one party, um, particularly in presidential races. Uh, and so uh, we uh, built out polling operations that allowed us to have large samples of African Americans, be able to look at nuance within the African American community. Um, so that uh, not just because we wanted to be able to, uh, to, to do the things that polling allows us to do, like uh, for our clients be able to say, these are the messages that will help uh, increase turnout for African-Americans, or these are the messages that will get people to, to, to actually vote. Uh, just one last thought. Because um, what matters here is, so, go ahead. Sorry, Charlie. No, no, I, I, I want to pick up on this point because yeah. I think it's important. And I think Jill's articles actually in the New Yorker are instructive. Uh, she writes and teaches me that in the 1930s, more than 90% of the people who might be surveyed uh, would answer the pollster or survey researchers. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, these, the survey researchers questions. Um, I've, I've had the benefit of advice from a friend, Molly, Molly Ann Brody at the Kaiser Foundation, who uh, led the uh, uh, the public opinion research group for a number of years and is, is very well founded in this. Uh, and, and Kaiser does a lot of polling on healthcare issues. But but she tells me now, unlike the number that Jill quoted of 90% in the 1930s, that only 2%, just 2% of people who are polled uh, now uh, answer the pollsters' questions. That to me is amazing. And whether or not you can get an accurate uh, an accurate reflection of the population as a whole from 2% answering um, is, is something that amazes me. And I, I will ask Barbara and Anthony about this, but Henry, the, what you raise is, are the underrepresented, are the African-Americans, are the Latinos, are the lower economic uh, classes in America, are they being heard in these polls? Do you think they are? Generally, no, right? I mean, and, and particularly not when we say not just black people, but let's say black women or uh, younger uh, you know, black, uh, black men under 40, right? There's a lot of messaging right now about uh, Latino uh, men um, uh, maybe having higher levels, African-American men having higher levels of support uh, for uh, Trump than we might anticipate when we look at older African-Americans or older Latinos. Uh, but that's based on uh, samples that, have, that are relatively small. Even if there's a decent sized uh, African-American sample, um, what we're actually seeing then is uh, the majority of those folks are not uh, under 30, for instance, and, um, and are not under 30 and, uh, and male. And so uh, now we're talking about maybe 30 or 40 people in a poll then being used to determine, oh, well, African-American males might have high, who are younger might have higher levels of support uh, for um, for Trump, when the margin of error is, is astronomical in in that kind of scenario, so it, it's not just that we are uh, are not polling enough, but then we're people are still or, or pollsters and and media are still using that data uh, when I think all of us would agree it's probably not the best idea to use that data given uh, the the very small sample sizes. Once we get beyond even just African Americans uh, down to this you know black men under thirty or something like that. Um, and, and so uh, we spend a lot of time trying to resolve exactly the issue you raised. So let me take this to Anthony. Anthony, if, if Molly's numbers are correct, and I, I, I trust her in everything she says because she's the expert in this, um, if, if, that's the small, if that's the small percentage that you're getting that are responding to polls, how can you get a, a sample that is representative both geographically economically, uh, in terms of education, in terms of race, in terms of gender. How can you do it with that small a number of people uh, willing to respond to your questions? So it's a problem and uh, pollsters wrestle with it. And there's two ideas everybody needs to get in this. One is the idea of representation and the other 
is a technical, uh, technical developments over recent years, which I'll explain very quickly. The idea when you do a sample is to create a microcosm of the country or of whatever you're trying to sample, a state or what have you. Now, George Gallup had an old line about tasting soup. Uh, I convert that, I, I uh, update that, if you will, uh, into using my grandmother's spaghetti sauce, because no doubt, I think my grandmother was probably a better cook than George Gallup. But um, what, you know, my grandmother would serve this spaghetti sauce and you would get a bowl of it and you didn't need to drink the whole pot or eat the whole pot to know if it was good or not. The mechanism by which you get that sample is that the meatball you got in your bowl was like the other meatball in the big pot. The Even the grain of salt that you got was like the other grain of salt. That's the idea of representation in and how it works in a sample. Now, getting that sample from a technical standpoint, I will very quickly say, has come a long way over the last 10 or 15 years. The fact is phone polls can do, still do work if they are done properly, as long as you can create that microcosm, but it takes a whole lot longer to do. You can't just do it in one night anymore, and it's very expensive. And number two is that the bulk of our polling and many polls that you see now are done by large online representative samples. There are companies that maintain millions of people on a panel and they are selected. The pollster still does the selecting. You can't just sit there on a website and click, but the poll who does the selecting of people who are on this panel and they spend a great deal of time maintaining and building out these panels so that they are themselves representative and pulling representative samples within that so that people can take the poll at their convenience online, on email, on their, on their phone, with an app, et cetera, which uh, work very, very well, frankly. Um, ours have been, you know, uh, I've been very happy with our accuracy as well as some others. So the point being, and I'll end with this, the point is that the good pollsters have always gone where people are. When people were living in their houses and didn't have phones, they went door to door. When people got phones, they went on the phones. And as people now use online and everybody's online, for the most part, now they use technology to create that. And that's part of our job. Can I just jump right, in right. for a minute? All right, Barbara, I want to take this to you. Yep. Oh, absolutely. I think I think um, Jill I, I, just I, wanted I, to I think Jill wanted to jump in and say something to uh, to respond perhaps to Anthony or Henry. Is that okay? Well, I, I I'm going okay, I'm going to turn to Jill fine. in a minute, but I, I sure. I do. <laughs> Yeah. I, I do. I do take this. I do take this as interesting. Molly tells me, for instance, that seventy-five percent of survey calls are now done to cell phones, and as we know, cell phones can can gravitate all over the country, and you keep your number locally. So that makes me question whether or not geographically you've got balance. Uh, she also tells me, though, you vote from you work from voter registration lists, which does reassure me in terms of geographics. But without getting too far in the weeds, it does seem to me. Anthony's reassurance is notwithstanding that you have to ask an awful lot of people to balance as Henry wants uh, for 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 uh, uh, ethnic background, uh, for economic background, for educational background, for gender and for and for uh, and for geographics. Well, um, so so we actually do polling the old fashioned way at at the uh, at the Marist Poll at Marist College. Um, we do phone interviewing, um, landline and cell phone, as you point out, Charlie. Yes, 75% of people now have a cell phone and we all carry it around in our pocket, which kind of actually makes things a little bit easier, believe it or not, for pollsters because we don't have to now randomly select a person in a household. You are attached to your phone. Um, and it's it's going it's going to ring. Some of the differences, and I'm not going to minimize the certainly the, the drop and collapse in response rate is compared to the 1930s. But in the 1930s, we had completely different technologies. But we still, in the polling industry, count our non-response rate in the same way. So, for instance, there is a whole host of phone numbers, and when we're randomly dialing numbers, and um, we use the soup and the stew example um, as well, it's not that we have to kind of have a, a category for everybody. 
We're not going to go out looking for um, a woman with a college degree uh, who lives in the suburbs. Instead, because if we as scientifically stir that stew or Anthony's grandmother's sauce, we get a very good sense of what that sauce is going to taste like by just taking a teaspoon of what it is. Um, the drop in response rates we thought was a really big red flag. I remember, you know, polling decades ago, um, and you needed to have a, a response rate of at least 50% in order for uh, people to think that you had a representative sample. But what we have found over time, particularly doing election polling, is that as long as we're drawing this sample scientifically, in other words, we've got a whole pile of random numbers, mostly cell phone now, but still landline, um, we actually do get a very representative sample and all those boxes do fill in. Now, Henry's right. We do at times undercount um, other um, groups within the population. But the more we use cell phones, uh, the better our sample is in terms of its representativeness. Now, what Anthony pointed out is it's very expensive and it's very time consuming to do that. So what we've ended up with in the in the kind of the, the public debate and the public realm is a lot of quantity, tons and tons and tons of polls, but not a lot of quality. In other words, scientific polls that are done with a scientific right, methodology just, 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 that your friend Molly um, is is at Kaiser is one of those folks who's doing exactly that. So Jill, do you buy it? Do you feel that the science has um, uh, you is, know, is, is, is up to the task of, of being able to work from such a small sample? You know, I think that the methods that, you know, that Anthony and, and Barbara and Henry are working with are the best possible methods available. And I, you know, that moment in the 1980s when the response rate began to fall below 50%, all reputable pollsters said, we will be out of business if it goes below 20 um, and so these new methods that involve, a lot of them involve waiting, um, they involve using a different kind of a sample, have done a lot to address some of those problems, poll aggregation addresses some of those problems. I, I still think the problem that Henry raises has really not been solved, and we also haven't looked at just how devastating it was to American public discourse over the course of the 20th century that George Gallup, for instance, refused to poll black people. He just didn't. He had a nationally syndicated newspaper column called America Speaks. He was very well intentioned. He started the scientific polling industry to fight fascism. You know, fascism is about fascists telling people what to believe. Pollsters thought they were there to tell leaders what the people believe, like to listen. And um, but he was nationally syndicated and Southern newspapers said, don't you poll black people? We will not report that. And don't ask anybody a question about civil rights because we'll drop your column. So, you know, what politically we think about the intransigence of the two parties throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s around civil rights, they, you know, they were, the elected officials were relying on polling data and ignoring what, what people were doing in the street because then the polling data was completely whitewashing the question of race relations. And I think, you know, how, however heroic what Henry is doing but, is, it's a, it's a quite, in, in, quite difficult problem even today. Because what you end up with is a very small group of people who then have to kind of count triply to represent their segment of the population. And um, you just you just get a less accurate read of that. I, I, I know Barbara and uh, Anthony and, and Henry, you've brought some, some slides, PowerPoint slides, and I'm gonna get to those, but Henry, just one very quick answer. Sure. Um, the majority of, of, of cards that are, um, what do you call them, that are on temporary phones, that aren't on permanent phones, what, what do you call those? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Prepaid phone cards. Uh, okay. The majority of prepaid phone cards, uh, basically you know, people in lower income groups, uh, African-Americans, Latinos, uh, are, are they sampled enough or, or does that really worry you? Well, I do think that I mean, we, we do a lot of work to try to get to those populations. and. We, we actually screen, you know, uh, we look at making sure we have enough people who are low income. We actually, one of the reasons that we use, uh, uh, we, we tend to mix uh, phones with online because there are different populations within the black community 
um, who were more likely to capture uh, with uh, one tool versus the other. Um, and so I think it's really about figuring out how do you how do you get there, and as you make that soup, as if you make that gumbo, given my background, um, as you make that gumbo, it, it's really important that that you keep looking at uh, uh, at each poll, like what are we seeing, where do we feel like there might be some gaps, um, and, and really checking yourself and having others uh, take a look. Um, we bring in a lot of uh, scholars from around the country to look at our our data, but also how we're um, how we're how we're designing questions. Um, African American scholars around the country. Uh, to, to try to find the right balance. These are tough questions. I think people have given great answers. These are tough questions that I think we all struggle with um, all the time. All right, Barbara, I know you've got some some uh, PowerPoint uh, slides here and, and let me have you go through them and I'll uh, turn to Anthony and then Henry for theirs. Uh, go ahead. Or I'll just take a couple of minutes to, to kind of address some of the things that uh, that I've been looking at as I've been looking at uh, 2020 uh, uh, and, and uh, November 3rd. Uh, a couple of things. The first thing is, um, you know, we, we look to electoral stresses um, often as being uh, issue based. And that's very true. I mean, when we look at what we've been dealing with over the past month and the context within which 2020 election is taking place, we see the economic recession, lost jobs, closing of small businesses, a lot of disruption. We see racial inequality. Um, we see, you know, protests. Uh, we also are dealing, you know, front and center uh, with coronavirus, 200,000, should I say 220,000 uh, deaths. Um, and certainly uh, that is something uh, still continuing uh, with infections rising is, is front and center of this election. But there are also some underlying structural uh, changes uh, that we have seen as well. Uh, first of all, the, the proportion of people of color over the past three decades. And I just wanted to you know, point this out. If you look at this graph, um, if, you, if you look at um, 1976, when uh, what we saw was the proportion of the non-white uh, voting population was at 10%. And even if you go to 1992, when uh, we had the Clinton campaign, 87% of the electorate was white. Um, and you can see very quickly how this has changed and it is continuing to change. And that's a very significant structural change that is occurring um, in, in our democracy. And we're seeing, and we're seeing that, uh, we're seeing those frictions and that, that contrast that taking place and playing out uh, in, in our politics. Um, in the next slide, um, I also wanted to show you how something else has changed uh, structurally in our politics. If you, if you look at the first slide uh, to the left on the top, 1992, it's very boring. It's very white. It's not very red or blue. And what that indicates is these are the these are the number of counties uh, where a candidate, presidential candidate, won by 20 points or more. And in 1992, we only had 93 counties that were designated as landslide counties. Uh, in 2016, it was 1196. And this isn't just due to redistricting. This is also a movement. This is a movement throughout the country uh, toward urban areas. And, and it's a, really a geographic se segregation uh, that, we're dealing, that we're dealing with now. And what this, what this plays out to be is in two things. In polling, um, one of the things that we found in studying the elections, not only of 2016, uh, but we also looked in depth of the Kentucky election in 2019, is that we found what's really, really important is to make sure that we have geographic um, representation. And that a lot of the things that we have done as a, as a, um, as a sector, as a, as, a, as a polling kind of business, is we've tried to make things more economical and we've tried to figure out ways to make um, to allow us to do things faster. And as we've done that, we've actually moved away from uh, making polling more representative. Um, the, the next slide I have is um, the fact that we're going to be knowing quite a bit on election night. And um, we have 37 states that have been carried by the same party um, in the last four elections. So we're actually probably walking into election night 
uh, with you know 195 electoral votes for the Democrats, and you know plus or minus 179 electoral votes for the Republicans. And it's the 164, obviously, that we've been that we've been focusing on. And if I go to the next slide, uh, we can see that the poll average has shown that Biden leads in most of these key states, uh, but again with the early vote. And remember that the polls right now are counting everyone who plans to vote, regardless of how they're voting, whether they're voting absentee in some states, voting early, or plan to vote on election day. And we've seen through polling and through public polling how that is really different depending upon whether you consider yourself a Democrat and Repu or a Republican. The Democrats voting early and the Republicans planning to vote on election day. Um, and then on the next slide there, there is the, the Senate. And I know we'll probably get to these uh, questions, you know, uh, when we open up the questions to the audience as well. Um, but, but what I've seen is that uh, 23 seats of the 35 uh, that are up for re-election um, are held by Republicans. And the Senate is going to play, you know, an enormous role. We've already seen that um, in the last um, couple of years of the Trump administration with the change in the courts. And so right now the makeup is 53 Republican and 47 Democrat. And what we're looking at is the class of 2014 now that's up for re-election. And this included, as I mentioned, the 23 Republican seats and the 14 Democratic, um, which were elected during um, Obama's second term. But out of those 37 seats, there are 11 Senate seats that we actually can focus on watching. And the next slide, you can see that the light gray states, they don't have any elections this time. The dark gray are the toss-ups. And then you can see the light blue, which are the leaning Democratic, the darker or the solid Democratic, and then in contrast, the light, the light red, uh, leaning Republican and uh, Republican. And so what we see is that there is a very close contest. Um, Biden, if should Biden be, um, you know, we should Biden be elected, um, then uh, the Democrats need to pick up three seats. Obviously, that changes if he is not president. Um, if you look at the next slide, um, you can actually see some of the contests. A couple there that I wanted to point out. One is that the Democrats are likely to lose Alabama. So that is going to be one down for them. Uh, Doug Jones having uh, won by a squeaker uh, last time, um, in, and but, at, but against a, a candidate, a Republican candidate, that had some difficulty with the significant sexual allegations. Um, that's likely not to happen with his uh, opponent uh, this time. The other one for the Democrats is they have been, Republicans have put a lot of money into the Michigan race. Right now, Biden is very strong and we do see a very strong relationship between which presidential candidate wins a state and the Senate candidate that follows them in. Um, otherwise known as coattails in the in the old days. But Michigan is one to watch because the Republicans have a, a strong candidate there and they've put a lot of dollars there as well. Um, some of the other ones that have gotten attention, Lindsey Graham in, in um, South Carolina, um, um, McConnell in Kentucky, and those are certainly long shots. And you know, if you do see this blue tsunami, um, that's something that might happen, but those, those, those seats are long shots, but I'd be happy to, uh, you know, talk about any of those. The last thing I just wanted to mention is that as we look to election night, uh, less than two weeks from tonight, uh, one of the things that we're going to see is North Carolina and Florida, they have traditionally had very efficient counts. Now, you know, 2000, notwithstanding with Florida, they've come a long way um, in two decades, but they have very efficient counts. At this point, they're also counting their early vote. So those are going to be two states we're going to see early in the evening that are going to give us a really good sense of whether um, Biden is going to be strong. Um, if he wins either of those, um, he's likely to uh, declare uh, the president. Um, if Trump um, wins both of those, then all bets are off, and I likely we're going to have a, a very long few weeks. 
we'll talk about that in a minute. Although uh, Florida, though it does report uh, uh, traditionally rather early, uh, Florida obviously in 2000 uh, took about <laughs> what was it uh, three years uh, oh, or whatever it exactly. was to, uh, to exactly. report. Let me, Anthony, let me go. They have a very different system than they did uh, 20 years ago. But if I carries one of those two states, the Trump, the Trump uh, a road to uh, to 170 electoral votes becomes very problematic. Anthony, let me go through your slides uh, as quickly as you can. Sure. Um, if we if we can get to just slide one, um, and I forgive me, I can't see. But if you're seeing a map, uh, are you seeing a map that looks like the uh, the, the U.S. has battleground tracker on it? Um, are we seeing that? We will in a second, I think. Yes, okay. go ahead. So. This is me choice for president if they want the next four years to. No, let's let's put up maybe um, backwards, but this is calm and exciting. Okay, well, look, if you're seeing that one, then let me uh, now now we've got the map. Now we've got the map. Okay, all right. So, so here's the lay of the land the way we see it. Uh, I don't have a mute button, by the way. So, I (laughs) (laughs) go ahead. The map is up. We, you you know, put up a slide, I'll, I'll talk to it. So, look, here's here's the lay of the land the way we see it. And I, I really want to echo a little bit of what was said earlier about, about explaining things, not just predicting them. When we put up this map and we do our battleground tracker, we have an estimate for every single one of the 50 states. We have interviewed people in all of them, our models, which if we want to go into the weeds, I can explain. But we have models and we have polls from all of them. And the point here is to show the race as it stands now, I am not predicting who is going to win, is out as it stands now, in electoral college terms. And one reason that I want to emphasize that this year is that I think there was a great deal of confusion in 2016 when the polls, the national polls, were in fact very, very accurate. And you know, most people know Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but that does not get you the presidency. Well, if you went state by state, as I think Barbara mentioned earlier, you could see the race getting tighter and tighter. But mostly, I also say that there wasn't enough state polling. There wasn't enough good state polling in 2016. And we did some, and we liked some, and you know, some we, we could have done better. But we didn't do enough, and so this year we're, we're doing them all. And that's point one uh, in this. Talk, talk about the presidential election in terms of that it's decided in, which is the electoral college. Number two is that inside this map, there is a story, and it's the 2020 story. Across the industrial Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, the ones that you know quadrennially we see as battleground states or toss-ups or, or tight races, we again have fairly tight races. Now, many of them at the moment are leaning towards Joe Biden, hence colored in blue. But the real difference in 2020 is that now we have the Sun Belt, and many states there are in play. I did not expect to be talking about Texas being merely lean red, and in some uh, some polling, it's it's dead even in 2020, maybe 2024, 2028. Arizona is a toss-up. Many polls, including ours, have Biden with a marginal lead there. Florida, we've talked about, and Georgia and North Carolina as well. Georgia, also a a toss-up. The story here is that, A, in many of these states, demographic changes and metropolitan areas filling up with college degree holding voters who've been moving towards the Democrats are starting to swing these states. We saw a little bit, we saw a lot of this actually, in 2018. That's a story and that's a big demographic break to watch. And secondly, a lot of these states moved into play over the summer when voters in these states were uh, feeling very negatively about the way that the Trump administration had handled the coronavirus outbreak. And we saw that and we saw coronavirus views being very strongly correlated with vote. And that in turn put a lot of these states into play. And there I'll just go to one more slide here if I could. And that is the one where you see 44% of seniors. This is out of Arizona, but I think it's an instructive example. Um, When we asked folks there, did the policies of the Trump administration, do you feel they put you more at risk or less at risk uh, for the virus? And when 44% of seniors told us they felt they were more at risk, 
almost all of them, 95% were voting for Joe Biden. And so that's just one example of how that became correlated with vote. And it goes back to the higher point of explain the race. I will lastly say that the president remains competitive in so many of these states, including the ones that are leading to Joe Biden, because, and this is another big part of this election, his base of support, while he is losing some on the margins, has been incredibly supportive and incredibly strong. His supporters have been very, very strong. And I suspect that when we get to election day, given the splits in the mail and the early voting, it's going to be a question of, okay, the Democrats have built up perhaps some of a vote lead in the early vote, and can Trump supporters go to the polls en masse on election day and make up the difference? Um, I'll leave it there. Henry, your slides. Sure. So the first slide uh, for me should be the one about uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. Make sure that that's up, and I'll just run through them. Um, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So what I wanted to do was just... There's um, a little bit of a lag, Henry, but we'll, we'll get there. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, going to use um, uh, word, word clouds um, for, uh, for a couple slides here just to talk about the two biggest issues that are, uh, that are driving African Americans um, to the polls uh, this election, because I think there's incredible, uh, I'm using word clouds because I think they show um, emotion. And basically in a word cloud, um, we're asking uh, for uh, a one or two word answer. Um, and then uh, the respondent uh, uh, tells us how they feel about something. And so um, uh, back in May, uh, we did uh, one of the first, maybe still the only uh, poll of African-Americans um, about COVID-19. And uh, what you see in this word cloud is just the, the, the terror, if you will, right, in the African-American community all the way back in May about uh, how, how scary, deadly um, these words uh, kind of just uh, evoke um, uh, a fear and, um, uh, uh, you know, dangerous, contagious. Um, and, and it's not surprising that now, um, as, as we head into November, this is uh, driving. This is uh, one of the two top issues. Let's go to slide number two, which is going to uh, really uh, uh, looks at um, uh, the second uh, big, uh, big issue, um, which is uh, issues of uh, racial justice um, and uh, policing. Um, criminal justice reform, but really the issues of race um, and uh, uh, really are also driving um, African Americans. And depending on the state, um, race can be uh, number one or uh, uh, coronavirus uh, can be number one. Um, but here you really see the exact opposite. So this is a question we ask um, when thinking about Black Lives Matter, what one or two words uh, come to mind? We see enormous support for Black Lives Matter uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement, for Black Lives Matter protesters um, in the Black, uh, among Black voters. Um, by enormous support, I mean 90% uh, levels of support um, at all ages, um, both, both genders, uh, different, it doesn't make much of a difference uh, economics, uh, uh, how much people earn. Um, and here you really see the exact opposite, right? This idea of things being dangerous, scary, death, deadly, uh, when we're talking about coronavirus. When talking about Black Lives Matter um, and, and, and protesters, this is really a feeling of power and, and strength and uh, uh, belief in, in the potential for, for change. Um, not necessarily the way that uh, white voters are thinking about um, uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, so uh, let's go to the uh, next slide, um, contradictory views on vote by mail, slide three. Um, and uh, so I think in the first two slides, we're, we're actually showing the kinds of questions that we ask that might be a bit different um, than other pollsters might ask and, and, and the way that we think about those questions and, and how we bring scholars, uh, African-American scholars together uh, to, uh, to do that work. In this, in this question, um, we, we're, uh, really trying to understand vote by mail. And we did this um, uh, polling 1,300, over, just over 1,300 African-Americans um, in August uh, for the Voter Participation Center, uh, which is a big uh, voter registration and get out the vote nonpartisan organization. Um, and what we can see here is, um, you know, would you, uh, uh, w we're basically asking here, uh, uh, would you prefer to vote in person or would you prefer uh, to um, uh, prefer to vote by mail, and we tested different messages. 
Um, and what you can see here is people uh, actually believe they prefer to vote in person because when we test the message, my vote is more likely to be counted. Um, uh, two thirds of people agree, uh, two thirds of African Americans agree with that, um, prefer to vote in person because it makes a statement about uh, black people's right to vote. Um, uh, just over 70% of African Americans agree with that. Um, but 74%, uh, almost three quarters of African Americans agree with the idea that uh, they would prefer to vote by mail because it's gonna be safer. If you go back to that poll that we did in May on COVID, that fear kind Henry, of I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, Henry. For, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you. I, I don't understand how 71% can prefer to vote in person and 74% can prefer to vote by mail. Uh, that's, uh, that's 145%, Henry. Yeah, so the, so uh, that, doesn't, two, that doesn't work for me. Yeah, absolutely. These are two separate questions, right? So we ask two separate questions. We're asking, um, you know, if we said to you, okay. Uh, you know, would you prefer to vote in person um, because it makes a statement about black people's right to vote? 71% of African Americans say, yes, I would prefer to vote in person. Um, but then when we ask, would you prefer to? So, yeah. yeah. I know it's confusing, but this uh, is the I've, point, I've, right? That people are holding I, two diametrically opposed views in their head. And, and this. There's a. There's a yep. Go it's ahead, a so. general perception, Henry, whether they vote by mail, whether they vote in person. I'm I'm very impressed, Henry, that the that the lines that I'm seeing for early vote, uh, there is such a very large. This is only anecdotal, but there's a very large percentage of African Americans in those lines. Right. There is a perception, indeed, it's it's backed up uh, statistically, that the black vote in uh, the African American vote in 2016. Uh, did not turn out for Hillary in a percentage that uh, allowed her to win. D does it does it seem to you? And I go back to to Barbara's earlier one that that we're now up to 31 percent uh, in this country minority. Uh, do you do you see the minority vote turning out? Uh, whether oh, yeah. they want to vote by mail, whether they want to vote in person, are they absolutely determined to vote in a way yeah. that they didn't in 2016? We did focus groups in Texas, um, and what we heard uh, there, we actually had one woman, African-American woman, who got up and said, uh, you know, it, it was a focus group about COVID, and she said, I, that I, you know, it will take an act of God to get me to not vote. Um, and what we're seeing is a real concern about vote by mail, a real preference for vote by mail because of safety, but a real distrust of vote by mail. Uh, because of a concern about whether or not my vote will actually be counted. And what we're seeing now is kind of a, a midpoint, which is this mitigation of early vote, right? And so people choosing to early vote, hoping that that would mean that it would be, that, that they know their vote's going to get counted and that uh, it might be safer. But these long lines are making it not, not so clear. Um, and what we did then, it, let's go to the very last slide, is we looked at, okay, so if People hold these two views. I, 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 I'm, I'm feeling unsafe, maybe I should vote by mail, but I believe my vote is more likely to be counted if I vote in person, right? A real concern about distrust of, of the electoral system. Um, what we said uh, for what we developed as a message, which was whether I personally prefer to vote in person or by mail, that should be my choice and no one should deny me the right to vote by mail if I so choose. The idea being, being that vote by mail, uh, voting early, that these are all different uh, choices and they ought to be your choice. And this message tests off the chart at 90%. Um, and it opens the door for us to then say, well, you know, vote by mail or, or vote, in, uh, vote early. Um, and you'll, you're starting to see this messaging um, all over the place now, that it's my choice. These are your three options. All right. Size your choice. And so let done. me turn to today's polls as they stand, and maybe most of the people watching have, have been anxious that we get to this. But uh, you, you, you have—I've been convinced, obviously, by 2016 and in 2012, two out of the last five elections that we've had for president of this country, the majority has voted for the candidate who lost because of the electoral college. Yeah. Uh, 2000. Uh, Al Gore and the 2016 Hillary Clinton. So today's national polls show Biden with a double digit lead uh, really across the board when you average out all the polls, but we'll put those aside. Uh, in the, the states that you talked about, Anthony, in the, in the uh, so-called Rust Belt, 
uh, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania. If, if Biden wins those three states and holds all the states that Hillary Clinton won, he wins the election. Uh, if he turns those three, and Pennsylvania is absolutely critical, but in Wisconsin, Biden, the average of polls plus eight. In Pennsylvania, plus uh, six and a half percent. Uh, and, in, um, and in Michigan, an average of eight points up. So that, that, that's certainly very encouraging, I suspect, for Democrats. And, and Trump, in order to win, has to hold, uh, it seems to me, six critical states uh, that he won in 2016. And it's problematic that he can do that. In Florida, Biden has a considerable lead. In Georgia, Biden's up a point, averaging the polls. Uh, in North Carolina, Biden up three. Ohio even. Texas, Trump uh, one plus one. Throw in Arizona, uh, which is a, a bit of an outlier, and Biden is up four. So let me get just a very quick answer, because I want to get to the audience questions from each of you. Do you believe those? Do you think those are accurate now, um, given what we've talked about in terms of what happened in 2016, the changes in methodology, the low number of people who respond to polls? Do you think those are accurate? Anthony? They are accurate representations of people's preferences and stated intentions to vote. They are the, the uncertainty in this election, and there is uncertainty in this election, involves balloting and turnout. Now, it always involves turnout to some degree. But in this case, where we have so many millions of people who are converting the way that they do things, they're converting over to mail, they're voting early for the first time, et cetera, that introduces a procedural uncertainty that polls may or may not be equipped to handle very well. We ask people if they're going to turn out. We have turnout models, which we can give a little more weight to people who've done it before, if it's a habit, et cetera. But these are all things that are 2020 uncertainties, and I cannot stress that enough. Finally, I would just say that when we see numbers, sometimes we conflate that with something that's really, really precise. Every poll is an estimate. We do our best to bring you the state of the electorate within two or three points, and that is as well as we can do. Now, I like to look at that as it is amazing that we can talk to just a handful of people and do that well. And yet, if you are trying to parse the polls between one and two points, that's not going to work out. Okay, things are within a range. So all of that introduces a certain amount of uncertainty that people need to be comfortable with. And that's the real politics of the uncertainty in 2020. Barbara, let me take that question to you. Absolutely. And the polls, I mean, the polls are measuring what we're seeing right now. They're not measuring their future, but certainly the the trends and there's nothing in the polling right now to to suggest that uh, there's anything different in the conclusions that you just mentioned um charlie but you know 2020 also isn't 2016. one of the things that we've seen is very very different um this time than last time um, and this is not to say that things can't change because four years ago we hadn't even had the release of the comey letter yet so we had a lot of campaigning that was going to happen in the last 10 years, 10 days rather. It did feel like 10 years, but 10 days of the campaign. But in this we, time, we haven't seen a we, lot of a lot we still of, have another Absolutely. We have another, yes, and we have another uh, 13 days uh, to go. But we we haven't okay. seen a lot of movement in the polls. Uh, this time um, in, in 2016, uh, whoever was, you know, in the news uh, was likely to be hurt. They were to be behind. So at, at times when, you know, Clinton was ahead, it was because we had some revelations about Trump and vice versa. Um, this time we've seen steady state. You, you mentioned uh, you like to follow the president's approval rating. Well, the president's approval rating actually has looked like a flat line during most of his administration. He's been in the low 40 something um, in most of the, the national polls, uh, and even in the states that we've been doing, he's been, you know, pretty, pretty steady um, as it goes. Also this time, um, I think we have very, very few undecided and, and a very, and a handful of what we call persuadables, people who say that they're going to vote for a candidate, but then also tell us they might change their mind. And that wasn't the case um, in 2016. So there's a, there's a lot of differences. Um, yeah, I think people need to be cautious 
um, about how they project this into the future because things do change. Um, but I think that we're also seeing a lot of differences and I agree very much with Anthony that we, we have a different issue this time um, that because of the fact that we have had different means by which people will be voting, we're gonna have a different way by which votes are getting counted. Yeah, I want to get Henry and, and Jill in very quickly on this, and then I want to go to audience questions. But Henry, I, I, there's, there's demonstrably was a large undecided vote that turned in the last uh, 10 days. It may have been because of the Comey statements. It may have been other reasons, uh, but there was a lot of undecided. I, particularly in the, in the uh, African-American communities, uh, I haven't seen anything budge. And, and indeed, in, in other polls, I haven't seen much, which I think and this is just a personal impression. Uh, I, I think people have made up their minds at this point, and you're not going to get uh, much change. But do you have? Do you sense that there's any um, undecided vote out there that, that could, could be significant? So, Charlie, look. In a normal election year, this election uh, would be over. An incumbent president has never been behind by double digits with less than two weeks to go before election day. The reason we can't tell you who will win beyond some ethical considerations is that polling can't compensate for systemic failures in democracy, whether those are attacks on the right to vote, armed hooligans showing up at polling sites, uh, the failed vote by mail system, threats to the post office or, or vote by mail by a sitting president. So we obviously have an anti-democratic electoral system, uh, you know, uh, the electoral college that's, that's based in slavery, but 2020 goes far beyond that. So I agree with what Anthony's saying, but I would go even further and say that uh, that this should be as easy as you're describing it, but the attacks on democracy are uh, put, make, polling can't uh, over, can't compensate for that, can't address that. Uh, it's not designed to do that. And Jill, you're the historian. Let me give you the last word on this, and then I'm going to turn to audience questions. And one of the, this is short-term history, but one of the things that strikes me is that in the 2014 midterm election, that was the last Obama midterm election, there were 92 million votes. In 2018 in the midterm, which was in the after the Trump presidency had begun, two years into it, there were 112 million votes. 20 million more people showed up. And given what we see anecdotally in the lines, et cetera, it certainly would appear that Americans get it right now that voting is really, really, important. And as an historian, when you look at this and you see that Americans haven't always voted in very large percentages, I would think that, that from you as an American, as a whatever, and as an historian, would be somewhat heartened by this. And it would portend a large vote in 2020. 2020. I do think it portends. I, I think a large, we should be expecting a very large vote. Remember that um, balloting was done in public until most, most states until 1896, which was also the last presidential election year, the first presidential election year, which someone was not killed at the polls. Um, voting was extremely dangerous in the 19th century and you had to vote in public. You had to display your ballot and to indicate to everyone at the polling station, which was outdoors, how you were going to vote. When voting moved indoors and became safer, turnout actually plummeted which is weird. I think people had lost a sense that it was a public office. And there, so much of this political struggle over this last year, and certainly over the whole of the four, last four years has been uh, a realization by many people of how fragile our democracy is. And so I do think that voters, those people who are lining up for early voting, have a sense that this is an, this is an essential act of citizenship. This isn't like, will I go and buy a new shampoo today? That this is a public office that we have an obligation to conduct. And that we have an, like, I think that the preference is so interesting in Henry's data to conduct it in public because it is a public office, right? Like we would rather go get the brownies at the elementary school and chat with the school children who are lining up at the door at our precinct place and have that sense of, of occasion. As a historian, though, I think one of the big untold stories and one of the reasons for me the election has so much uncertainty, aside from the difference between polling and count, actually counting ballots, um, is how atomized we are. You know, we're having these conversations. We're not in a room together, the five of us right now. And the kinds of 
in the last two weeks before the election, the family dinner that you go to, the conversation that you have at a football game, the brushing up into someone in, at the grocery store and then sitting, you know, going out in the parking lot and kind of duking it out. The, the kinds of shifts that people have as citizens by encountering one another in communities, the church session that you go to that really makes you think differently about your moral obligation to your community that week and might change your vote. All of those in, intangibles, those ineff, ineffable qualities of our face-to-face -face react re, relationships to one another that pollsters can't count for because they're they're not individual. It's not like one person, one phone call. They're about exchange. They're about communication, and what that concept, how that factors into how people actually vote this year is 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 a great entirely in an unknown. All right. So let me turn. Thank you both, all four of you, actually. Uh, uh, all interesting answers and, and educational to me, I hope, um, although getting anything through my thick skull is sometimes hard. Um, but anyway, first uh, audience question. If 98% of the population are not answering survey researchers, what of those who do answer? Can you trust the answers? Are people inclined to tell you the truth? Barbara? Well, What's interesting is when we look at just the 2% of people that we are um, are speaking to, um, we're actually, it's not that we're not speaking to the other 98%, and I know this sounds really strange and not to get too much into the weeds, but the way response rates are calculated um, don't necessarily have to do with people not talking to us. It has to do with uh, also phone numbers that, uh, that don't connect, um, that just ring or are busy all the time, um, or where there's no answers. Um, so there's a whole host of um, things that happen after we dial a random number that goes into uh, what our response rate is. And so it's not that we actually try to talk to 100 people and we talk to 100 and only two of them will talk to us. Um, it's we dial 100 numbers and we only get two people to talk to us. And it, it may seem you know, like a uh, distinction uh, without a difference, but it's very, that, that, that is very significant. So that's the technology reason. The other thing is, um, and I think we've talked a little bit about this, is the fact that um, if a survey is scientifically conducted, and I'm saying scientifically, meaning that we, have, we know the likelihood that we're going to be talking to a particular person and that we are setting up our, our, um, our interviews in a way that most people are able to be possibly contacted. Um, we do end up with what Anthony was describing earlier as that microcosm, that representative microcosm um, of Americans. And one of the things that I think um, in public polling at least there are very few times when pollsters are accountable, but we're very accountable on election day. So you can get a very good sense as to whether we're a good poll or a bad poll by finding out, you know, how that, that uh, is that is true. And, and 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 after 2016, I think some of you probably felt you took your lumps. I know Anthony, you wanted to weigh in on this. Well, it's a it's a wonderful question, and thank you for it. The, um, the question of whether the people tell truth tell the truth to pollsters is one we get a lot. And I always ask a question back, which is, why would someone spend 10 minutes, maybe more, taking one of my surveys or one of Barbara's or Henry's and, and to pretend to be somebody that they're not? <laughs> Surely you have something better to do. So if I'm asking you or you know, you're voting for the Democrat, now consider this. If, if you pretend to be voting for the Democrat, but you're a Republican or vice versa, now we're going to ask you 15 or 20 other questions. And you're gonna go through and you're gonna answer or you're gonna check in the case of maybe one of mine. And you're gonna have to pretend to be a Democrat or Republican and think about how they would answer the question. Oh, you're, wait, you're for tax cuts or against them? Are you think of this for foreign policy? No, the other side thinks this for foreign policy. That's a lot of work, okay? Why are you doing all that work? And I can tell you empirically that if you look at surveys, people are extremely consistent in their answers, right? It doesn't look like they've, oh, wait, I was pretending to be a Republican, but now I answered all the other questions like a Democrat. Like, they, the answers are very consistent. So we don't see it. 
But there's an important difference here in what you intend to do versus what you end up doing. And here we come back to this idea of turnout. Now, people tell us they're going to vote. Not as many people actually vote as tell us they're going to vote in the polling. We can do some things to account for that, but does that mean you're lying? No, it means you intended to, but something came up that day. You didn't get there. You didn't have a chance. You, you know, somebody got sick in your family and you had to take care of them, right? So that's not a lie. It's you intended to, but you didn't get there. And that's the behavioral component to it where, yes, we can lead to some inaccuracies. It doesn't mean people are, are, are fitting. Henry, uh, let me take this question to you from, a, from somebody who's watching, which is the effect of social media on mm. polling. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious by those who want to extrapolate information out of tweets. And yet I know that the vast, vast majority of tweets are come from a very small percentage of the public. Uh, indeed, most people don't use tweets. Uh, the, the, uh, the groups that you're worried about in terms of being sampled probably use tweets a lot less. Told most of the tweeters are uh, older white people. Uh, I say older, over the age of 18, uh, and uh, and they are better educated than the majority of the population. Uh, do you see social media in, in, in having an untoward influence in any way on 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 public opinion and and on uh, and on where they with the way people respond to polls? I, I think social media is such an incredibly diverse. Uh, concept, right? So you have a tool like Twitter, which is uh, used by a lot of uh, mainstream media, press, right, um, as a way to get stories um, and uh, and share uh, uh, information. And so information and, and political stories in particular move much more quickly um, and, and grow. And, and that can be very positive in many ways. Um, but it also has a lot of problems that we've seen, right? And um, on the other hand, we have uh, tools like Facebook, um, where uh, you see much less participation by uh, uh, more mainstream uh, press, and and uh, and there you have a, a, a misinformation that moves very rapidly, dangerous uh, information, um, you know, uh, that, that moves very rapidly, uh, white nationalist uh, messaging, um, uh, threats to uh, sitting governors, uh, moving rapidly um, across those tools. I think it's um, uh, it doesn't really I think affect polling yet. I don't think that will continue to be true. I do think uh, right now. I mean, you know, you could do a Twitter poll, you could do a Facebook poll. Those are the exact opposite of scientific and what Barbara's talking about. Um, but I do think there are interesting models that are that are emerging. Uh, there's a group Push Black that we work with that has five million uh, folks that that they can communicate with through uh, Facebook Messenger, um, and they're trying to use that to find uh, scientific ways to pull their membership in order to, to develop a, a, a black agenda, um, a political agenda that reflects the interest of, of the black community. Um, and, and a sample size that big, you could actually start to do some of that, especially if you weighted it to the census. Um, so I think there's there there's it's not there yet, right? So it's a little different question than what they're asking. I don't know that it influences our work at all right now. But I, I think social media will continue to change. It'll start, there'll be new products that come out, new, new platforms. And I think we all have to kind of keep looking at those and looking for opportunities uh, to, to use them. I think certainly all of us now use them to get the word out about the research we've done and, um, and, and use them to, to, in, you know, to, to be part of the public narrative. Jill Lepore, I, I, I asked this question somewhat reluctantly. Um, because I, I, I believe as a television guy in relatively short answers, but, but I, it was a question I wanted to ask you and it came from a viewer, so I'm delighted to bring it up, um, which, is, which is to speak a little bit about the role of Simulmatics, uh, the corporation that you found in Kennedy's campaign and how that uh, has evolved uh, subsequently. Um, uh, I, I, you've written 300 pages on this, and uh, so, so I, it's difficult to ask you to, to boil it down, but give me some sense of, because this has evolved in, a, uh, in an increasingly sophisticated ability uh, to try to target voters and to get a sense of what they're thinking, and, um, and, and it, it, it worries me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think we could think about maybe three different elections where there was a lot of public concern about the influence of polling and prediction of the election. One would be 1948, you know, the famous Dewey beats Truman miscalculation 
one would be 2016, you know, where people were completely, many people were surprised by the outcome. And the other is actually 1960, which was one of the closest popular votes in American history between Kennedy and Nixon. Um, Simulmatics was founded in 1959 to get the Democratic National Committee to take a stronger position on civil rights. Uh, it was a bunch of behavioral scientists and computer scientists who wanted to try to convince Democrats that black votes matter. And um, they, they devised what they call the people machine that could run an election simulation. So people do election simulation all the time. Um, they fed into, you know, an IBM 704, one of these old mainframes, uh, all of the existing public opinion information that there was, they took like all of the punch cards that were in the archives of Gallup and Roper. They took all the census data that they had, all the election returns they had, and they came up with an imaginary population of the United States that was a perfect polling population. It was 3,000 imaginary Americans. And then they said they could run endless simulations on this population, including narrowing it down, dividing the electorate into voter types and narrowing it down so that they could run a simulation that said, if Kennedy took a stronger position on civil rights, how would black voters change, would they change their vote and move from the Republican party because blacks had voted for Eisenhower in 52 and 54. So it's, it's a- And it's, I've, 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 I've often wondered about this because if politicians are simply looking at numbers in that kind of simulation of people and they say, okay, if we take this position it's going to be uh, get me X number of votes. And if I take that position, I, I, I'll, I'll lose votes. So I worry sometimes that, that the people that we vote for who are supposed to be leaders become followers because they're merely, uh, they're merely reflecting what uh, the Simulmatics groups uh, found is the opinion of this model America that they've created. Well, that, you know, that's the big critique of campaign polling, which is we haven't been talking about this evening. We've been talking about public polling and media polling and public opinion survey research. But campaigns run this kind of polling all the time. And I interviewed a lot of people who do this work um, a few years ago. And I said, you know, if you could design, if you could have a perfect poll, like you knew it was accurate and you gave it to you know, a member of Congress who would go into the hall and vote on a piece of legislation and she thought she should vote for this legislation, that it was for the good of the country. But she had like an app that could do an instant, perfectly scientific poll of her constituents. And her constituents said, no, they don't want this legislation. What do you think should happen? And all the pollsters, pollsters, I, pollsters I talked to said, well, she should vote against it. And that's actually not our system of representative government. Like we elect people to make decisions in the best of the public interest. Like, yes, you're answerable to your constituency, you run for reelection. But right, leadership is actually called for, which is how Simulmatics was much derided in public and was really controversial. And Kennedy, after winning, had kind of a lot to answer for and had to sort of deny that he had been influenced at all by um, uh, uh, by the advice that, that Simulmatics gave him. But of course, that is very much the world in which we live now, that that kind of um, yeah. um, uh, segmenting of the electorate, sending targeted messages to specific voters, which, which increases division within our political culture. Um, a lot of that, I think, lies, lies at the feet of people that do that kind of campaign polling. I, I would never correct you on anything, but uh, the Dewey Truman was 48, not 38, but that's all right. Henry, let me, let me yeah. ask you, because um, Henry, I, I, I may have, uh, done something wrong here because I, I, I tended to, to be talking about the African-American vote as monolithic. Mm. Uh, and, and it's not, although it certainly is heavily weighted or has been traditionally a one party or the other. Uh, so I, I, somebody has asked, what, what African-American community are you talking about? You talk about it as if it's monolithic. And I, that's probably a mistake I shouldn't, I shouldn't be making. Yeah, in fact, we, we exist because it, uh, you know, our, the reason we created this, uh, this firm um, is because the African American community is not monolithic, but American political parties have treated it very much uh, as if it is monolithic. Um, and so uh, but, but let me give just one example. Um, it is the case that uh, Donald Trump is not going to get very much of the black vote. Um, and that's not really where we should be focusing primarily with, when we're thinking about the black vote. The choice is not primarily between whether to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden in the African-American community. It's whether to vote for Joe, Joe Biden or not to vote. 
Um, and so uh, what we are often looking to do is to figure out, uh, and this may be a little bit of what Jill, Jill's saying, um, but to try to drive uh, uh, the public discussion. Uh, so I, I think this might be what Jill's arguing against. So I'll throw it out there. Um, we're trying to drive, we're trying to learn what would, uh, why it is. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is learn why it is that African-Americans are making that choice. Um, and then uh, trying to get uh, the public discussion to reflect the issues that actually matter to African Americans, um, so that they that they'll be fully engaged and excited to vote. It um, it's not monolithic, but um, America has treated African Americans um, for hundreds of years in very monolithic ways, and so as a result, there's a political history that African Americans share, um, and their voting uh, reflects that. Our voting reflects that. Uh, one other question, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, the number of COVID cases are increasing. Uh, we may be in the second wave, third wave. I don't, I don't know which wave we're talking about anymore. But, but there's no question that in so many states, uh, the COVID cases are going up. Uh, a, do you think it's going to affect the vote? And uh, uh, B, is it reflected in, in, uh, in what we're seeing in survey research? Or, or um, uh, do you think it, it, could, it could surprise us? Uh, in terms of whatever effect it might have one way or the other. Uh, Anthony? Uh, yes, it is. It's already affecting the vote. Um, one of the things we see very strongly is the correlation between people who are themselves worried about being exposed, about getting the virus, and people who are voting, in this case, against the incumbent for Joe Biden. And that is uh, putting a number of states in the, into play. I think I, I alluded to this earlier. And it has moved a substantial number uh, of votes. And we see in state after state, when asked, who do you think would do better on handling this, Biden comes out ahead. And that, in fact, is, is correlated with, uh, with, with support for him. Um, but one thing I would add, and this is an important um, tool of polling as well, is that we often see, we see disagreements in the country about the extent of the outbreak. We saw earlier this summer, Democrats tending to feel that the number of cases and even fatalities, unfortunately, was uh, underreported, that there were more than being reported, and Republicans, in turn, feeling that the number being reported was, was an overstatement. And I, I point to that example a lot because it, it underpins this, this thing I mentioned earlier, where part of politics and part of a campaign is debating in a healthy democracy, you debate about how to solve problems. But what the polling is also showing us is that Americans have very different views of even what the problems are or even the extent of them. And so this, I think, is informative in, in starting to have a discussion and a public discussion and a public debate on what it is that we need to, to talk about. You know, Jill, I think, you know, mentioned that the conversations in the dinner tables, et cetera, with, you know, maybe in, in shorter supply this year, unfortunately. And that's a part, that's part of the public sphere is, is debating all of this. And the polling shows us big discrepancies and big differences like that. Um, Barbara, let me ask you a, a sort of an existential question for all of you, uh, or particularly for you and Anthony, uh, which came from a viewer. Uh, if we didn't have polling at all, if you guys uh, weren't in this business and so many hundreds of others who are as well, do you think it'd be any different? Do you think you'd have a different result in elections or do you think polls have a significant effect on how people vote? Uh, I tend, again, I think I, I kind of described myself as a, as a science advocate. And I do think that as pollsters, survey researchers, people who are measuring opinion, um, I think we can have an impact at different points in the process. I think it's very, I think there's a very significant impact that we have during the primary seasons. Um, very often, if a candidate is not doing well um, in the polls, they, uh, they don't, they have difficulty raising money. They have difficulty getting on the debate stage. I mean, we've seen quite a number of candidates in the, in the primaries these uh, last two cycles. Um, and and trying to figure out who ends up on the debate stage, we've ended up with different tiers, tier one and tier two. And, and, I, and I think that in that sense, uh, I think polls 
are do a terrible disservice um, and they shouldn't be part of, of that process. Um, but, but that said, um, I, I think if we think of all the numbers and you know, the way we perceive um, how people look at different issues, um, I think Donald Trump is someone who really doesn't fit that mold. Someone who doesn't really fit the mold of a, of a candidate that is strategizing, um, you know, based on what the majority thinks. Um, I think he, if he um, had, if he had um, taken a majority stance in a couple of very significant issues, I think we would have seen a different reelection effort. Um, but the, the rise of Donald Trump and the administration of Donald Trump, I think, actually speaks to um, how little effect of polling and um, the opinions of what polls find as majorities uh, or the opinions of specific groups um, has not really had any impact um, upon uh, governing. Was it? All right, I've got, I've got five minutes and I want to get one minute from each of you and then we'll wrap it up. One minute, as if you were on the, on the debate stage now between the candidates. Um, is this, is this election going to make any difference? That's what worries me. We are so deeply divided as a society. Our views are so widely divergent. Uh, and the, the ability for civil discourse in this country, um, when we meet friends who, who may disagree with us politically, we're always reluctant to get into political discussions because they can become heated. And my question is, no matter who wins this election, uh, is it going to, do you see anything in the polling that would lead you to believe that things will be different in terms of the national division that exists after this election is over? Henry, I'll start with you. Uh, I think if Donald Trump is reelected, uh, no, th there won't be. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the very fundamental uh, issues of democracy um, are on the ballot. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of positive that we see in, in polling. Um, I'll point quickly to two things. One is people actually care about many of the same um, issues um, and issues that matter uh, uh, to, to black folks um, and the solutions uh, that that uh, the majority of black folks want around, say, things like criminal justice reform are not generally particularly unpopular with whites or with Latinos or with Asian Americans, right? That the the, the big issues, health care uh, costs, for instance, are issues that, that Americans share, and many of the solutions are broadly popular. Same thing uh, for uh, citizenship for uh, DACA uh, young people. Um, and, and I think the other uh, thing I would say that I think is, is really positive is that um, if it wasn't for polling, uh, then we would just get to hear what elites, you know, including all of us, think is important. Um, and we wouldn't, you know, it would just be, what do you think this election is about, Bob and, uh, you know, and, and Judy? Um, and that's what would be happening, um, you know, around the table at CNN. And nobody would be able to kind of correct that and say, well, no, nope, that's not really what people are, are really focused on. And we know this because of the polling that, that's been done um, you know, uh, by Marist. Um, so th that, uh, that actually uh, helps, I, I think. We've talked a lot about what might be wrong with polling. Polling helps uh, uh, democracy, I think, in some key ways. All right. Thank you, Henry. I appreciate your participation tonight. Jill, you have one minute uninterrupted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we've been very good at not, no one needed to be muted by the host. <laughs> uh, I, would expect people, I agree with much of what Henry said, although I do think there are some quite insidious effects of polling. I think the way that it emphasizes individual choice as opposed to our commitment to a public good, um, it kind of relies on a model of, of a, a political system that we don't have. And it has driven us towards a hyper-individualized political culture. Uh, what we need is a culture of community and of comedy and of polity. So I would urge I would urge viewers to take a look at the website for More in Common, which is a public opinion survey organization that specifically undertakes to investigate what it is that Americans do share by way of values and political preferences. Uh, some of their research is just fantastic, and it 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 calls into question a lot of the. Um, sort of in instincts of, of, of major polling, polling organizations, which I think has the effect in many cases of 
overemphasizing divisions, um, the way the way questions are asked. And Warren Combs just really committed to the idea of, you know, what if we what if we empirically look at this question differently? So um, I also just want to end by thanking everybody. It's been really fun. I've learned so much about this election from all of you. So thanks so much. And 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 thank you, Jill and Anthony. You a minute. Uh, is anything going to be different in terms of a, a national consensus, if one can possibly exist after this election? Well, if there is going to be uh, more conversation and more constructive dialogue in the public sphere, I would argue that that starts with understanding not just what you feel passionate about or think, but understanding what your neighbor feels passionate about or thinks. And I would argue that there is a role for polling or for folks who want to read a well-done survey to inform that. And possibly, maybe this is a bit, you know, uh, pie in the sky, but possibly to inform that conversation that people can have and promote that understanding. And the last thing I would say is that one of the great honors of doing this job and privileges of doing this job is that you get to hear the opinions of so many people and you come to understand that there is in fact so much that Americans have in common and that many of us feel the same way about the same many things. Um, the political discourse is often weighted towards those who have the loudest voices or the most enthusiasm and that's all well and good for them, but there are a great many Americans that share a great many things in common and we learn that from Poland too. And Barbara, the last word is yours. Well, I would certainly concur with what Anthony um, has just said from the polling we do, from the focus groups that we do, um, we see a lot of people willing to tell us and take the time um, and tell us you know, how they feel, what they think. And uh, Anthony's absolutely right. We all have much more in common uh, than our politics uh, does suggest. Um, and I think that part of that is uh, leadership um, and I am hopeful that um, what we will see um, on November 3rd is, uh, is a movement, regardless actually, um, of who, who wins the presidency, because there may be changes um, in the Senate mm -hmm. as well. But I think that every American who is uh, standing online um, for hours and hours and hours and taking the time to follow the polls and to follow the issues um, mm -hmm. and to make their voices heard is something that we should uh, really all take to heart and be very optimistic about. And so I would also like to well, thank you uh, for corner. having me and uh, definitely a, an interesting discussion, which I'm sure we could go on and on for, uh, for hours. We could indeed. And I thank all four of you for, uh, for joining us. The uh, Kennedy Library discussions are always interesting. As, as one of my political directors, uh, uh, said over and over and over uh, when I was at ABC, you know, the only poll that really matters is the one that comes on election day. And, and that is indeed true. And, and I saw a wonderful quote that was sent to me again by, by Molly Ann Brody that came from Ariel Edwards Levy, who is the, uh, I, I gather, the uh, uh, polling director or political director at uh, HuffPost. Uh, polls are nowhere useless nor perfect. But if you treat them as though they're going to be perfect, then they will become useless. I thank all four of you for being with us. Uh, uh, I sign off. All the best to all of you. And I think your admonitions at the end are very important. People need to vote. This is an important election that has been said over and over. It's now a cliche, but it's absolutely true. To those who are watching, to the four of you, good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.